We're continuing on this morning in the Gospel of John, so um, we're going to be studying in John chapter 16, but I'd like to backtrack just a little bit to John chapter 15, verse 18. So if you would open your Bibles uh, to John 15, verse 18, and we're going to get a little momentum as we approach chapter 16. The reason for doing this is because uh, sometimes the chapter divisions in the Bible, uh, the Word of God is inspired, but the chapter divisions aren't. And sometimes they seem to fall in an awkward place, and I think this is one of those instances where it falls in an awkward place. The setting is uh, the Last Supper has ended. Uh, Jesus and his disciples, having had that Last Supper, uh, they arose and were heading over towards the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus will pour out his heart before his Father in heaven. And they're, they're talking as they go. And there's been a lot of things that have been said. Uh, Jesus has been talking about them loving one another uh, a lot. But then he also reminds them that though they love one another and though they love their neighbor as, them, as themselves, that there will be opposition in the world. And so I wanted to pick up the, the, the narrative, if we may, in John chapter 15, verse 18. Uh, Jesus says this to his disciples, his followers. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And we mentioned that that word hate means anything from a violent opposition to just a disinterested or opposed or to, to have little esteem for someone. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my namesake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. For he who hates me hates, the fa hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, new, new idea, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will testify, be, and, you will, and you will also bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Now our text for today. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God's service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you asks me where are you going. But because I have said these things to you, your sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Let's pray. Lord, we, we pray that you would teach us well today, Lord, that everything that we need to learn to continue on with our life with you, Lord, that we would apprehend it, that it would settle into our minds and into our hearts and change the way we think and change the way we live wherever we need changing, that we'd be encouraged, comforted, challenged, whatever needs to happen, Lord. Thank you, God, that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, Lord, able to divide between the intentions and thoughts of the heart, Lord. And so do your work here among us and and once again, we pray, Lord, for Lake County, North Napa County, for your mercy and your grace to fall uh, like the rain from heaven, Lord. And if you would send rain, we would praise you, Lord. We'll praise you anyway, but Lord, we pray that you would assist those people, God, and help, help us to know how to help and use us for your glory. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 15, Jesus, as I said, was talking about loving one another, and then he stops kind of and says, though you're loving one another and loving the world, there's gonna be opposition against you. And then at the end of chapter 15, he says, but the helper is gonna come to you, the Holy Spirit's gonna come to you. 
And he's going to talk more and more about the Holy Spirit as we go through chapter 16. And so he's, he's not rambling. It's, it's a long continued line of thought. It's, it's one narrative. It's one monologue. It's one teaching that he's giving them about continuing on in the world after his departure, after his ascension back to heaven when he goes back to the Father, that the disciples and, and every Christ follower would continue on with the work, would continue on with the message. We're called first to love one another as, as Jesus has loved us and to love the world, to love our neighbor as ourself. And we're called to not back away from that when there's opposition. And when there's opposition, many times we can feel like, I can't do this, it's too hard, I'm challenged, I'm, I'm afraid, it's unfair, my feelings are hurt, all of those kinds of things. And Jesus says at the end of chapter 15 there, the Holy Spirit's gonna come and he's gonna testify of me. The Bible teaches us and the, the word about the Trinity, and the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, but the principle and the understanding of the triune Godhead, three persons, in one Godhead. It's taught in the Bible, and we, we, we receive that information and that truth as we read through the Bible. There's what is called God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit. And Jesus, when he was in his incarnation, when he was in flesh, manifested God to the world, but he could only be at one place at one time. And he's telling his disciples here, it's better that I leave you, because when I leave you, God the Spirit will come. I've been with you physically in one place at one time, but he will indwell all believers all over the world for all of the ages. So Jesus is encouraging them to continue on with the work and telling them how they're gonna be able to continue on with the work by the assistance of the Holy Spirit. But in, in telling them to continue on with the work, he's also just reminding them, listen, there's gonna be opposition. And he doesn't want them to be surprised at that opposition. He wants them to even kind of expect it so that when it comes, their faith won't be shaken. So look at verses two and three again. Jesus tells his disciples, they're gonna put you out of the synagogues. So expect that. They were Jewish men. That was, that's how they were raised, worshiping God in the synagogue. They're gonna put you out. The time is gonna come that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service, and these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. So, he's just warning them ahead of time. To, guys, to be put out of the synagogue, there were different degrees of, of excommunication, and essentially, these guys are gonna experience the fullest degree of excommunication. When you're put out of the synagogue, not only are you not allowed to worship there at the local synagogue in whatever Jewish town you live in, but you're ostracized publicly. You're ostracized culturally, and society, the Jewish society would kind of turn their back on you. This would affect you socially, this would affect you financially, you know, you go into town and you, you're kind of, you have a stigma about you. You're, you're marked as one of those followers of the Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth. And so he said, expect that kind of uh, pushing out that's gonna happen to you. He didn't want them to be uh, surprised. In verse two, he says, those who do that will think that they're offering God service. And that word service actually speaks about liturgy. They're gonna, they're gonna think that they're doing the right thing and that they're actually doing it for God and it's an act of service to God to drive you out and eventually even kill you. And we see that happening in the book of Acts. Not long after the ascension of Jesus, the Spirit of God was poured out on all the Christians. They began to proclaim the name of Jesus with a newfound boldness, with a newfound energy, with a new zeal, new confidence, and opposition from the Jewish leadership, which was the first type of opposition that they encountered, it was vigorous against them. They commanded them to not preach about Jesus, they threatened them, they imprisoned them, they flogged them, but the disciples wouldn't be quiet because they were so filled with the Spirit of God, and they responded to the, to the Jewish leaders of the day, should we obey men rather than God? We can't help but testify regarding that which we have seen. And so their testimony was vigorous and, and they were opposed, like Jesus said. The Apostle Paul, in Acts chapter 26, Philippians 3, 1 Timothy 1, he was initially a violent persecutor of the Christian church. He consented to the death of, of the first Christian martyr named Stephen in the book of Acts, Acts chapter seven. He stood by, he wouldn't pick up the stones to kill Stephen, but he held all the garments, the coats of those who killed Stephen. So he thought he was doing a religious service to God. 
And those who persecuted in that first century, both Jewish leaders and then later on, uh, Roman and Greek pantheists that believe in the multiplicity of gods, they persecuted the Christians because they wouldn't bow down and say Caesar is Lord. When, it, when the coals were lit and the citizens of Rome would come and put a little pinch of incense on the coals and it would go up as a, as a, as a fragrance you know, to, the, to the pantheon, if you will, the Roman citizens were required to say Caesar is Lord. And the Christians would say there is no Lord except Jesus. And so they were initially persecuted by the Jewish religion, by the Jewish leadership, I should say, secondarily by the Roman and Greek culture, just like Jesus said it would be. I did a little homework. The early church suffered great persecution. By the year 325 AD, there were an estimated seven million Christians in Europe, but already in 300 years, 200 million of them had been put to death by different cultures, primarily the, the Roman emperors. Different persecutions would arise on occasion. So it's interesting to me in verse two, verse three, they will put you out of the synagogues. The initial persecution against Christians was from the religious corner of society. We see that same kind of persecution today with Islam, don't we? Killing Christians in, in their minds, doing a service to Allah. And so that same sentiment carries on today. We saw it in the 50s and 60s and all of that uh, with communism, but it seems that uh, the swing has, has moved back to kind of a, a religious persecution of Christians around the world. By the way, it, it's, it's estimated, and the, it, these are hard numbers to nail down, it's estimated that probably in the last 50 years there have been more Christian martyrs than in the first 300 years of the church. There's still a lot of Christians today that are suffering for Jesus. Not only imprisoned and loss of materials and possessions, but giving their lives. And so the persecution continues. I would really, off the notes for a minute, I'd really like to recommend to you guys to encourage and challenge your faith. Uh, there's a book called uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs that you need to read. And then there's another book, I forget the name of it, it's a modern day, Debbie, do you remember? Anybody remember, it's, it was put out by the guys from DC Talk. Jesus Freaks, yeah. Jesus Freaks, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was done in conjunction with, with Richard Wormbrand's organization. Voice of the Martyrs. I really want to encourage you guys, buy those books and read about the persecution that has happened in our lifetime and still goes on. I, I feel like, like a spiritual ant compared to some of these folks that have stood up for Jesus in our lifetime against communist Russia or Romania or in, in, the, in the Far East or wherever the case is in the Middle East. I, I, it just, it humbles me and encourages me and challenges me. So I would really encourage you. It's, it's very good reading. There's short stories, one or two or three pages about this person or that person or whatever, but it's, it's very good stuff and it's very sobering and it brings needed perspective to our lives. So, Jesus here explains about future opposition that is coming. He, his intention in telling them, look at verse one, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble, and then down in verse four, these things I have told you that when the time comes you re may remember that I told you of them, and these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So he didn't want his disciples to be, a, to be uh, surprised. He didn't want them to be shocked at, at, the, at the persecution that was coming. The word stumble there, it's not stumbling block as we often read or think in the scriptures, but it talks about the spring of a trap. It's like a, a trap that has a, a spring to it and you step into it and suddenly it's upon you. And Jesus said when it happens, it's gonna come suddenly upon you. You're gonna go from seemingly like everything's okay to like nothing's okay. And he, he just says, I just don't want you to be uh, I don't want you to step away from your faith. I don't want you to lose faith. I don't want you to think that you've chosen to do the wrong thing with your life. I have a note here. It's been suggested, and, and I, I, I agree with this. It's often easier to handle the trials of life when we're not surprised. When we, when we know things are going to, to be tough, it doesn't mean that the trial itself is easier, but when the shock value is gone, 
I mean, one, one of the aspects of, of losing somebody suddenly to you know, a sudden death is the shock of it. Um, it's, you know, when somebody is dying and has a long sustained illness, that's, that's a, a hardship of its own, but there's time for the mind and the emotions to, to kind of grasp it at least and move along with it. And it, it's harder for the person, of course, well, it's harder for both the person who's dying and, and the caregivers as well. But there's something about a sudden trial or a sudden death that has a shock to it that can shake us. And Jesus simply wanted them to, to be able to avoid that. have another note here. The Bible informs us of many things to not be surprised about. The Bible tells us about the condition of the world in what is called the last days. The Bible tells us about persecution if you're a follower of Jesus. Those who want to live a, a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The Bible tells us about the consequences of sin. So if you're dabbling with sin or actively involved in sin and then something happens, None of us should, you know, if you're a follower of Jesus and know your Bible, none of us should, be, should say, why did this happen? The Bible says there's consequences to sin, negative consequences to sin. It's intended to keep us from sinning. That's one of the reasons. But, you know, we shouldn't be surprised when, for instance, uh, the one thing that comes to mind, uh, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what fellowship does light have with darkness? And sometimes we see it, a, a, a a Christian marry a non-Christian. And there's some degree of compatibility in the belief that maybe the other person will come to Christ or something like that, and then the bottom drops out and, and somebody sometimes is surprised and, and, and we need to say, look, you know, God loves you and he, he warned you to stay away from this. And so the Bible tells us so much about things that will happen that we shouldn't be surprised at. The Bible tells us about the falling away of many from the faith. In the last days, many will fall away and turn their back. And so it just goes along with what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look it, you're gonna follow me, persecution's coming out. I, I don't want you to lose your faith or think that this is out of the ordinary or that something wrong must have happened or that you did something wrong. This is part and parcel of what it means to follow me. And he's just doing this for their uh, steadfastness. So he warns them in verses one through four. He talks about future opposition. Then he talks about what's gonna happen when he leaves, which was really bothering them and really had them concerned. Look at verse five. But now I go to way to him who sent me, and none of you ask me where are you going, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Now he says something to them, I'm going away and none of you have asked me where are you going, and if you remember the, the chapters that we've been studying recently, uh, we'll look over at John chapter 13, 36, just a couple pages to the, to the left there. John 13, 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. And over in John chapter 14, verse five, Jesus had said in verse four, and where I go, you know the way, and you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? So it seems like they've talked about this before. So I doubt that Jesus has a bad memory like me, <laughs> because not only was he a younger man, but he was God in the flesh. <laughs> so his memory was intact. So there has to be something else that's going on here. And I'd like to suggest to you, and this makes some sense to me, though those similar words were being asked, this seems to be a different kind of intention. And some of the commentators that I read, and I just submit this to you, is this, is this the absolute answer? Don't know, but this is what makes sense to me. Their mindset has been, what are we gonna do without you? You can't leave us, everything is gonna fall apart, that the intention of their asking was, was not in faith, it was out of fear, and very self-oriented. Instead of asking that way, and, do, and once again, do we know that for sure? No. Is it a reasonable suggestion? I think it is. And Jesus here, Jesus here said, you haven't asked me. So all I can get out of that is, they're not asking the right way. They're not asking with the right mindset. I'd like to suggest to you that they should have been saying something like this. How will it be better if you go away? How, how are we going to, you're saying it's better if, if you go away. 
tell us how it's gonna be better. Instead of kind of throwing up your hands and saying, the sky is falling, life is over as we know it, why don't you listen to what I'm saying and ask me how it's going to be better? And so that makes some sense to me. Somehow they were misasking about this thing. Jesus is very gracious to them because, look at verse six, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. He understands they're just men. He understands what he has meant to them. He's been their Messiah. He's been their savior. He's been their rabbi. He's been their teacher. He's been the miracle worker. He's been the one that has words of wisdom like no man has ever had. He's been the one that has silenced uh, the voices of the opposition. He's been the one that has had conversations that have brought people to faith and he said amazing things that nobody else has ever said. And so he's been everything to them. So he understands that there's some sorrow there and he seems to be gracious about it and forgiving about it. He goes on to tell them he kind of challenges them a little bit in verses five and six, but then he goes on to tell them in verse seven, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, and it's not that he hasn't been telling the truth. <laughs> it's kind of funny, like sometimes you have a conversation with somebody and they say, well, to be honest, and you think, so what's going on before, you know? <laughs> it's not one of those kinds of things where Jesus is saying, well, okay, I'm gonna finally tell you the truth. He's been telling the truth, but it's a way to emphasize what he's about to say. It's like, listen, guys, listen to this. I'm gonna tell you the truth about this. It's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. So, in the minds of the disciples, the departure of Jesus is the worst thing that can happen. And he's actually going to tell them, actually, it's the best thing that could happen. There's, I'm sure there's a few lessons there for us, right? <laughs> we often think we, we know what, what the best thing would be for God to do in our lives, for our lives, through our lives. And oftentimes, it's the exact opposite. So... Um, I was chatting with somebody the other day and they said, uh, you know, I forget how they phrased the question, something along the lines of, I don't understand everything about this Christian religion, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. And, and what, do you, what do you do with all your questions? And I just say, listen, I don't understand it all either, <laughs> you know. If there is a God, which I believe there is, he's infinite, and, and I have just recently discovered that I'm not infinite and that I'm quite finite and I'm quite limited and my mental capacity is quite limited and, and I'm limited in so many ways. And if there's an infinite God that wants to relate to me, a finite man, uh, he can only give me so much because of my physical, soulish, emotional, spiritual makeup and my capacity, I can only take in so much. But he's given me enough to hang on to. I don't know everything about Jesus. I don't know everything about how he works and everything about the plans of God. And I don't understand all the theology that's written in the Bible. I don't, I don't understand it all. But, you, but I know this. I know enough to know that I needed a savior. I knew, I knew that I was incomplete and I knew that however my life was going, I, I needed Jesus into my life. I, I've known enough to stay with him all of these years. And as I have continued on, more light has come, and I've understood things that I didn't previously understand. I think I've told you guys this before. When I was in high school, I used to think, it was kind of, I think, during the Star Wars times. When was Star Wars, in the 70s? Okay, 76? Okay. Anyway, I, just, I used to think the Holy Spirit was kind of like, you know, kind of a mist that blew into the room, and kind of, ooh, and you know, I used to think he was an essence, you know, and then I learned he was a person, a person that wanted to speak to my heart and speak to my mind and, and illuminate the word of God to me and illuminate things about myself, and point being, it's just, it's just great to, to go on with the Lord and to, to grow and to, and to hold on to that which is clear to you and to, to move forward in the faith and to mature in the faith and to, and to discover things that you didn't know before. It's a great thing. And so Jesus here is being very gracious to these guys. They're kind of asking the wrong questions, but he's saying, look at there's a, there's a new paradigm, and the word's been so overused lately that I almost hate to use it, but there's a, there's a new paradigm that's coming. There's a new way of doing things that's coming. It's better for you. You need to discover this. 
It's better for you that I'm leaving. Verse seven, once again, I'm telling you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go, which they could not conceive. If I do not go away, the helper, the counselor, the paraclete, the one that comes alongside to assist you, he will not come to you. If I depart, I will send him to you. With his departure, the Holy Spirit would come and indwell all Christians worldwide forever. Jesus, as the God-man, was in one place at one time, and you'd want to be around him. But if you weren't around him, he, he wasn't reachable. He wasn't accessible because he was in one place at one time. And I've listed a lot of other um, passages here in scriptural references for you to connect the dots on your own. But it says in Romans chapter eight that whoever has the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And so the spirit comes and indwells every Christian, every person that says, yes, I wanna follow Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes and indwells, makes them born again and indwells them wherever they are all throughout the ages. And so instead of having to be in the physical geographical vicinity of Jesus, you know, there's Christians all over the world today, some that have celebrated their, their morning gathering already, some that have yet to do that. All filled with the Holy Spirit or all at least indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The disciples would learn to be led by the indwelling spirit instead of the external Jesus and this would require that they learned how to be discerning. I think this, off the notes for a moment, I think this is, a, this is a real challenge for us present day Christians. <clears throat> I think there's a real uh, sad situation that can happen in some church gatherings. People want to do well with God. They want to be good Christians. They want to do the right thing. They have very good intentions but they want the pastor to tell them what to do. They want the pastor to tell them how to be holy. What do I have to do to be holy? How should I dress? How should I raise my children? Should we homeschool or not? Should we spank or not? You know, all, should, children, should teenagers date? What should I do with my money? Would you please force me to give 10% so I can feel good about myself? Any number of things, and I've seen it, in certain church situations where the people, it's just easier to respond to some spiritual leader, some pastor guy that's just telling you what to do. It might be burdensome. It might be hard. You might resent that guy. You, you may not want to run into him at Valergus because you're buying a second gallon of ice cream. <laughs> and that seems a bit frivolous, you know. But if you have a person telling you what to do, you don't have to pray. You don't have to be discerning. You don't have to seek God. All you have to do is show up on Sunday and have that guy tell you how to live. And in some ways, in regards to receiving the information, in some ways, it's just easier to have some guy tell you how to live. You don't have to think. You don't even have to read your Bible because the church will tell you how to act and how to live, and they will assign and, and uh, connect with that uh, the, the uh, stature of holiness to your life. I'm a good Christian because I do what my church tells me to do. Anybody ever seen that? With any? It happens. And the, the, the upside of that is, as I said, you don't have to learn how to read or pray or discern the voice of God or interpret what God wants you to do. You don't have to seek the Lord. You don't have to be patient. You don't have to wait on the Lord. All you have to do is be a robotic church member. I'm not trying to bash church. I love church. It's the bride of Christ. But I just think with us as humans, that can be an easier way to do things. But guys, this this is exactly the opposite of what Jesus is talking about. I've been here, you wake up in the morning and I say, hey guys, let's go here. Okay, he said, let's go, come on, you know, roll call, let's all go, we're gonna, we're listening to his physical voice. They were not gonna hear his physical voice anymore. They were not gonna see the look on his face. They were not gonna see him talk to this person and respond to this person and all. The whole dynamic was gonna change. They were gonna have to learn how to relate to an indwelling Jesus rather than an external Jesus that they could see and and hear and touch. It was gonna require some maturity in my view. Is all of this part of this? I think it is. 
It's a lot easier just to have somebody tell you what to do. I kind of want to be a little bit silly right now. It's like a husband telling, you know, his wife, just tell me what to do. And she says, well, if you loved me, you'd know what to do, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. <laughs> it's a challenge of the century, you know. But how wonderful when the guy figures it out. It doesn't have to be told. So I got one amen here. Hey, ladies, <laughs> how wonderful when the guy has some insight and is paying attention, not to the list of rules on the refrigerator, but the, but the tone of voice, and he's been watching his wife or watching his friends and, and is learning. This is, this is how to relate to her. This is what to do. And the disciples are gonna have to go from an external Jesus to an indwelling Jesus via the Holy Spirit. And I just wanna suggest to us, it's a little bit of a rabbit trail, but I, I think it's appropriate for us all. You guys, the Bible says in Philippians, you guys work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Don't work for your own salvation, work it out. God has put it in, now you work it out. You're the one that needs to pray. You're the one that needs to read your Bible. You're the one that needs to have faith in God. Is it wrong to get counsel? Absolutely not. Is it wrong to talk about it? No. Ultimately, it's your decision. We are not robotic people, amen? We are people that have, we talk about, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Then go deep with that relationship. Learn the nuances. Again, I always have to talk about my, my marriage with Debbie because, you know, I, I, can, I can read her pretty well now, finally. <laughs> I can, you know, a little look, tilt of the head, tone of voice. Let me tell you a story. This is, this is just for comedy's sake. Um, uh, there's a gal that used to go to church here, Ro Ronnie Tierney. You guys know Ronnie. And Ronnie and I, uh, we're, like, we're like brother and sister in, in the sense that we wouldn't say good morning. I, you know, she'd show up and say, well, you look awful today. You know, well, you look worse. I mean, we, were just, we had that kind of friendship where we would just tear into each other, you know. And we, we just did it mercilessly. But it was all in fun. Um, and she used to, like, cook tofu and try to sneak it in at the potlucks and stuff like that. And, you know, she tried to give me something. Here, it's pork. It's not pork, Ronnie. <laughs> pork doesn't bounce, you know. It's like, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> it was one of those relationships. Anyway, I did a wedding one time, and Ronnie was, was there. And you guys can forward this to her. I think she'll get a kick out of it. Um, we were at the reception over here in the, uh, in the fellowship hall. And we were sitting there at the table. There were some guests at the table, but Ronnie was there and we were there. So, I, you know, the, the wedding's done, we're eating. And we just start tearing into each other, you know. And, and it's, we're just having fun. But my wife very wisely just puts her hand just like this. And I know that's, a, that's like, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's, what that, that's what that means. <laughs> Sirens, <laughs> you know. And I, it's like, I know I'm doing something wrong. I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna stop everything. <laughs> you remember, Deb? You totally remember. <laughs> because the guests had no idea that Ronnie and I had this kind of relationship. That we were, we were just teasing each other. But these guys were strangers, and I think they were looking at us like, oh man, these people are mean, you know? And so, just a, a, just, a, just a little touch on the leg, and I knew something's wrong. Okay. Why, because I know her and she knows me. The disciples were gonna have to go from having Jesus tell them what to do to listening to that internal voice. And I don't think they liked it necessarily because they were used to just being told what to do. And will, they willingly followed. But dear, dear brothers and sisters, it takes a mature Christian to sense the moving and the leading of the Spirit, doesn't it? That, take, that requires familiarity with God and His Word and walking in the Spirit and being in prayer and forsaking sin and seeking God and investing your time in that relationship. We are absolutely right in saying we have a relationship with God. Invest time in that relationship. If you don't invest time in your friendships, they kind of just die, don't they? They just kind of turn into nothing. Invest time in your relationship with God so that you can sense the nuances of God, the leading of God, the still small voice of God. Don't, don't make it to where God has to shout at you all the time to get your attention. Have a keen ear. I can pick her voice out of 100 women because I've heard it so many times. That's the kind of ears we have to have. We need to be inclined to the Lord that way, right? And he wants that. And guess what? He's done his part. How much more personal can it be? We don't have to go anywhere to find him. He planted himself in us. How much more personal could it be? It couldn't be more personal. 
I don't have to go anywhere to find him. He's within me because I said yes to him. And this is what Jesus is saying. It's gonna be way better, but you're gonna have to get used to it. You're gonna have to make adjustments. Verse seven, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you and I want the helper to come to you. You know, I was, he's talking about their advantage, but I just thought for a moment, it's also to Jesus's advantage. In this way, he knows he has to ascend to, to, to glory, but let's say that Jesus stayed with them and lived to 100 or 110 or 120 years old, and then he dies. What about the rest of the Christians then? Or, or, or whatever, you know? He cares about his whole church. It's so much better to, to indwell those that you love, that, that are following him, than to have to just kind of speak to them geographically. And I think it was a huge advantage for Jesus in, in this way, I'll be able to speak to all of them all over the world throughout the ages in the most personal way. So going on here, what's the work of the Holy Spirit? Now, now Jesus has been saying, love one another. He's also been saying, you're gonna get some opposition. He's also been saying the Holy Spirit's gonna assist you. He's saying it's gonna be better this way. So he's told them that the Holy Spirit's gonna assist them. Well, what about the people that don't wanna follow Jesus? What about the people that have yet to say yes to Jesus? He tells them the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of unbelievers. Verse eight, when he's come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, and of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So. He says the Holy Spirit is gonna come and convict. So look at your notes here. The, the word means a lot of things, and so we need to understand all that, that it, all that it means. It means to convince. So let's just reread that with that word. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will convince the world. He will reprove the world. He will rebuke the world. He will expose the truth to the world, and he will refute the arguments of the world regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit uses the word of God to convince the unbeliever about the truth of God. You guys with me? The Holy Spirit uses the spirit-led Christian in this convicting, convincing work. Now, why, why did I not just say uses the Christian? Because if the Christian isn't walking in step with the spirit, then they're probably not being used by the spirit. I was shopping at a store the other day. I'll make fun of myself and you guys are off the hook. I was shopping at a store the other day where they give you rewards, right? And you have to give your email address and your phone number. And every time you buy something, they say, well, what's your phone number? And so you can get your rewards. And I've been shopping at that store for like five years and I finally figured out I've never gotten any rewards. <laughs> I think I may have just had just a touch maybe of a bad attitude just for a moment. Never, hardly ever happens, but it did. Yeah. Anyway, I wasn't sure. I was trying to be, uh, well, how do I get these rewards? Well, you, you should be getting emails. Temperature's going up a little bit. I'm not getting any emails. I forget what the whole point of this is gonna be, but I'm just gonna finish the story. <laughs> and they said, well, what's your number? You know, and, it's, uh, and, and they go, oh, and your email is Pastor Bill Walden at Gmail? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then I had to stop and think, okay, how did I behave? Was I a good boy? It's like, I should have given him another email. <laughs> Some guy at gmail.com, you know? And I totally forget the point I was making. Oh, this is the point. I knew I was connected to something. The Holy Spirit uses the Spirit-led Christian to convince the world. The Holy Spirit doesn't just use the Christian any old time. Hopefully I was being a spirit-led Christian at that moment because suddenly what I am was out in public. Yes, I'm a pastor of a local church. How did I act? <laughs> you know, right? The Holy Spirit wants to convince the world about the rightness of God. And the Holy Spirit uses the word of God and also uses the spirit-led Christian. Because if you're not at the moment being led by the spirit, the Lord might use you anyway, but there's, there's probably less of a chance if you're in what the Bible says, the flesh. So let's look here then 
the things that the Holy Spirit does with the unbeliever. Let's just go through our notes. Convinces the world of sin. The Holy Spirit comes and convinces an unbeliever about sin. Sin is the truth about man, the condition of man, and the remedy for man's sin. Now you can look up these on your own if you want. Number one, refusing to believe that man has sinned and deserves God's judgment. This seems to be a huge hurdle for a lot of people. They say, yes, I make mistakes and this and that, but I'm not that bad. The Bible says, no, actually, you are that bad. The Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is eternal death. That's what the Bible says about man. There's a lot of people that don't ever want to get past that, and there's a lot of people that say, who are you to judge me? And my response often is, well, who, who are any of us to tell anybody that anything's wrong? Do you ever tell anybody that anything's wrong? Well, I'm not there to, to tell anybody that, that somebody's wrong, or who am I to tell anybody that they're wrong? If somebody's beating up your kid at school, are you gonna speak up or are you gonna let it continue? The bully needs to, to be told, you're wrong, you need to stop that. Or do we just let him figure it out over the whole school year and your kid comes home with a beat up face every day? You know what I'm saying? We ha- if, if there's any inkling within us to say something is wrong, that proves that God has given us a conscience. Now apply that conscience to yourself. Are you wrong? Be honest, the Bible calls it sin. And the wages of sin is death, but the remedy for man's sin is the person of Jesus. The Holy Spirit convinces a man not just that they've made mistakes, but that they are guilty before God and that they cannot save themselves. Ultimately, the greatest sin is the rejecting of Jesus who came to forgive sin. That's why in verse nine, it says, the Holy Spirit will come and convince the world about sin because they do not believe in me, the remedy for man's sin. Not only for forgiveness, but for transformation. It's the rejecting of Jesus that is, that is man's greatest sin. He's not talking about sins here. He's not talking about you're lying and you're gossiping and you're a drunk. And he's talking about the sin of rejecting God because a person says, I don't need him. And so there's a blindness and a deception there. Guys, I wanna encourage you. We, t- we share the truth about, about the nature of man. We share the truth with people about, about the sinfulness of man. And apply it first to yourself when you're in conversation with somebody. Just say, you know, I've said this to people. I know I'm a sinful person. I know I've sinned and I know I deserve the judgment of God. I know that about myself. But he's been gracious to me and I've accepted his remedy. We're not any better than anybody else. But we've we've had our eyes open and we know that forgiveness is offered and that we've received it. That's a big hurdle for a lot of people. But as you share that, just remember, it's the Spirit of God that needs to convince that person, not you. It's not your job. It's your job to say it. It's the Spirit of God's job to convince them about it. The heat's off of you guys, right? You can step, step out of that pressure. It's not your job to convince anybody that they're a sinner. God will do that. Secondarily, verse 10, to convince the world of righteousness. Righteousness is the truth about God. Look at verse 10. The the Holy Spirit will convince the world of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. The bodily ascension of Jesus proved who he was. He made all these claims about himself. He said, destroy this body and in three days I'll raise it again. And he came back from the dead as he said he was going to and ascended into heaven, proving his righteousness. So it proves that he is the approved method, if you will. He is the approved sacrifice of sin that God has established. He is, the, he is the one that God says, this is what I accept, the righteousness of my son. Do we have that righteousness? The answer is no. It's, a, it's applied to you. It's credited to you the moment you say yes to Jesus Christ. It's an imputed righteousness. And so Jesus is the one that died to give you that righteousness. The Holy Spirit convinces the unbeliever that Jesus was who he claimed to be and convinces the unbeliever that Jesus' death will grant them forgiveness if they'll receive it. Finally, verse 11, the Holy Spirit convinces the world of judgment because the ruler of this world is judge. Verse 11 doesn't say the ruler of this world will be judged. It says he is judged. 
the one who led the rebellion in heaven and the one that instigated the rebellion on earth is judged by God. And everybody who's under his sway and influence will also follow in that judgment. If Satan is judged for his rebellion against Jesus, all who follow him will be too. Look at 1 John 3, 8. He who sins is of the devil, influenced by the devil, not a Satanist, but just influenced by the devil, believes the suggestions and lies of the devil. He who sins is of the devil. The devil has sinned from the beginning. This is the perp- for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. I love that verse. So Jesus came to destroy, to overpower the work of Satan in the world and to judge Satan. The Holy Spirit comes and convinces people that there is a judgment. People don't want to feel guilty, but you know what? You need to. They, they need to. They need to. There needs to be a fear of the Lord. Jesus is, as a, as a friend recently said, he's not there to just fill, fill a mild gap. He's there to be your whole life. And we need his forgiveness. And the Holy Spirit comes and convinces a person that I've sinned. Jesus is the answer. And if I don't say yes to him, I'm going to be judged. And that's what Jesus is saying. Why is he saying that? Because the disciples are going to carry on the message. What are they thinking about? How can we do it without him? Jesus is saying it's going to even be better. You can do this. Look at the bottom of your page. There's some questions there for your life groups. Jesus told his disciples to expect opposition. He told them ahead of time so that when it happens, they wouldn't stumble, be stumbled. Has that warning helped you deal with opposition? Have you ever felt like, you know, he said this was coming. I, don't, I shouldn't have been surprised. In fact, I wasn't surprised. It helped me to be ready for it. Something to discuss. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would come to us and be in us question, Christian, how mindful are you that the Holy Spirit's in you and every other believer? How does that affect your relationship with other Christians? Knowing that, hey, you know what? The Spirit that's in me is in them. I don't have to force something to happen. Finally, Jesus said the Holy Spirit would convince people of sin, righteousness, and judgment. How does that help you or affect you when you're speaking to unbelievers? Does it give you confidence? I pray that it will. That unbelieving person that you want to talk to or are talking to, God loves them infinitely more than you do. He's prompting you to to speak to them and you may say, I don't have the right words and I don't know the Bible that well. You know your testimony. You can always give your testimony. And even if you only know one or two verses, just say those verses. God God can take a mustard seed of what you do and and turn it into something. Amen? Amen. So, So don't be afraid. Don't be surprised at persecution. Don't be stumbled by it. Anticipate that the Spirit of God wants to use you? Guys, walk in the Spirit. If you have any questions, you can send them in. One more little thing. When I was in high school, Valencia High School, class of 74, hoo-hoo, go Tigers. I was in marching band, alto sax, right? And you had to use your peripheral vision. There was the drum major in front doing this, so big old long thing, so we could see this little thing popping up, so we knew how to keep in step, but we had to keep peripheral vision going so that we could keep in step with one another, so when we go through the competition, we'd get judged by how well we're keeping in step. You couldn't lag behind that guy. When he turned, you needed to turn, you needed to pay attention to your music, you're reading music, you're using your peripheral vision, and you're looking ahead, and you're doing all of this simultaneously, and good bands do it well but you're keeping in step. You're not falling behind, you're not going ahead. The Bible says, keep in step with the Spirit. Pay attention, so that when any of this happens, your ears are on, your heart's ready, and God will use you in great ways. Any questions this morning? Guess not. You all must be listening to the Holy Spirit today. (laughs) Teasing. Let's stand together. If you're here today and and, uh, you don't know Jesus, so glad that you're here. If you're feeling that kind of that really awful feeling of like, man, I I think the pastor's telling me that I'm a sinner and if it feels like it hurts, you know, it's a, it's a love hurt. God's, God is, wants to convince you that you need him. He's not just, he's not just like MSG that you add to your food. He's everything. 
And he wants to convince you that Jesus is the answer and that without Jesus, there's a certain judgment that's coming. And so listen to that voice of God. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, so much for your great love. Thank you for the way you set it up, Lord, that we are not alone here. You said, Jesus, that you wouldn't leave us like orphans, kind of stranded and not knowing our way, that you would send the Holy Spirit to indwell us. It couldn't be better. It couldn't be closer, Lord. Help us to have ears to hear about what the Spirit is saying to our lives, Lord, and leading us. Help us to be encouraged. Help us to grow. Help us to keep in step with you, Lord, and be amazed at what happens, God. And Lord, we pray for any here today that don't know you, that they would know you, Lord, that they'd listen to that voice of the Spirit of God, speaking to them about their sin, and speaking about the remedy that's in Christ, and speaking about the right judgment of God that's coming upon all those who reject him. But Lord, your offer is out of love, and your offer is, is, is open to all. So Lord, may every heart be open today. And Lord, we pray once again for Lake County and North Napa County, Lord. Pour out your grace and mercy, Lord. Use your people, use all people to bring relief and aid, but especially to broken hearts, God, may people find you in this whole big mess, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you guys.